Well, as we discussed during the meeting, uh, Kazakhstan is going through a major transformation now, both economically, regional integration-wise, but also politically at home. And President Nazarbayev, you know, has been in power almost 27 years now, and uh, he just announced a series of massive political reforms, transferring part of his powers to the parliament and the government. So he will play a sort of a power broker role, bringing together economic security as well as the uh, business branches of government uh, together. As we uh, followed him through since independence, he has been an enlightened leader to push the country towards more reforms and also developing uh, multivectoral foreign and security policy with neighboring countries, including Russia, China, Central Asian Republic, and the West. So if there's a success story, if there is a constant talk of uh, Kazakhstan as a rising power uh, in uh, Central Asia, it's all thanks to his policies initiated. So these political reforms are important in preparing the ground as well to the next generational leaders, because Nazarbayev is uh, old folks and uh, he knows how to bring forces together, play with them. But what will happen after he leaves? Succession is a big question mark in the minds of many players, including investors in Kazakhstan. So there are several candidates whose names we hear and there, whether they will take over from Nazarbayev, but my guess is that he will never reveal, disclose any name because it will put him in a lame duck position if he does so. So succession is clearly the most important challenge Kazakhstan is facing because thanks to his leadership, the country uh, performed so well up to now. After him, if it's a nationalist leader, there will be clashes with China, with tensions with uh, Russia. Domestically, the new leader should be able to bring together southern clans, uh, western clans, as well as all the different stakeholders. So that's a huge challenge because everything is symbolized in the person of Nazarbayev today. That's one of the reasons why he's now distributing power because he feels that country has reached this maturity. The whole world is fraught with risks and uh, challenges. Kazakhstan is no exception to that. If we try to identify and quantify as well what risk China, uh, Kazakhstan is facing today, I think the number one risk right now is economic risk. Because of the lower oil prices, gas prices, commodity prices, as well as the uh, currency fragility, of Tenge vis-a-vis -vis US dollars, country is going through a difficult period because they have uh, committed to more spending than the budget or treasury could allow. And as a result, there is a shortage of funds. There is lack of access to international financial markets. And growth rate last year was around 1%. This is the lowest rate Kazakhstan had since 2008 and perhaps 2017 might be a bit or a little bit better than 2016 but overall we don't expect a quick recovery in Kazakhstan unemployment and also tension socially if you don't provide growth and also long-term plans that Kazakhstan has like you know 2050 it's good to talk about visions going beyond you know 30 40 years down the road but people are expecting, people in the street are expecting immediate results. So what's going to happen this year, next year, the following year? So economic crisis will be uh, very important to handle uh, intelligently and smartly. And second big risk is, as I mentioned, political succession. Who will replace Nazarbayev? Whether whoever comes after him will be able to put the country together and also deal with external stakeholders and the international community at large. 
And the third risk I think we are going to face is terrorist risk. Already we saw some terrorist attacks and the biggest fear we have as investors, especially in energy industry, whether there might be some attacks on infrastructure, critical infrastructure in Kazakhstan. Also, there is going to be a flight of uh, Islamic jihadists from Raqqa and Mosul when we tackle uh, you know, Islamic State and there will be a serious uh, effort to try to reduce their presence there. Most of the fighters will go back to where they came from. We know that there are fighters who came from um, Chechenistan, Uzbekistan, also Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, some Uyghurs, and also from Kazakhstan. So the concern is that whether the Fergana Valley with Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and also North Caucasus uh, might be entry points for further instability. Afghanistan is also there. And uh, I think the relations with Russia and China, perhaps we'll handle it later on, this might also create some tensions, serious tensions. And financially, most of the banks look as if they are bankrupt, saved, rescued temporarily by the state. So uh, the hydrocarbon industry uh, heavily depends uh, on uh, the investment coming from outside. Most of the FDI in Kazakhstan up to now, I think is about $250 billion. Most came for the extractive industries. If oil and gas prices and commodity prices do not increase as expected, because right now it's around $55, $56 for oil. And this is going to aggregate the already worsening economic situation in the country. And the efforts to diversify economy have not succeeded yet. It's not something you could do overnight. It will take over long times. But we clearly see that direction the government is taking is towards enhancing metallurgical, chemical, uh, refinery industry and oil and gas. You can't go beyond the oil, gas and uranium, especially where uh, Kazakhstan is the world's largest producer, 35% of the world's share, and also second largest uh, reserve holder after uh, Australia. So mining, uh, as well as metallurgical industries and oil and gas complex, they should all be providing the bulk of the Kazakhstan uh, growth prospects. And other diversification efforts like financial center, knowledge industries, tourism, and agriculture areas are going to be secondary to this uh, first three tiers. For Russia, Kazakhstan is the heart of Eurasia project because they share a long border around 5,000 kilometers. And if you remember during the time of independence, the proportion of Russian ethnic group within Kazakhstan was about 45%, almost half of the population. It came down now around 23-24%, but still this is a sizable population. Therefore, Nazarbayev in particular and Kazakhstan at large is very aware of the fact that Russia is a very, very powerful player in the region and within Kazakhstan. Therefore, uh, not by choice, but by necessity, uh, Kazakhstan pays utmost attention to relations with Russia. However, there are major concerns within Kazakhstan on how you tackle Russian issue. Because you may remember that after the Ukrainian crisis, uh, Putin made a statement saying that Kazakhstan had never had any statehood ever in history. This was very badly received, of course, in Kazakhstan. Uh, prompting fears that Russia might even use hard powers to interfere in Kazakhstan one day, which I believe will be very difficult because Kazakhstan is not Ukraine. And also Russia may not have a sustainable power as it has right now because it's a weak state, strong leadership. So we shall see how uh, Russia will be proceeding because if it also attacks Kazakhstan somehow in any scenario, I think it will face stiff uh, resistance, not only from Kazakhstan, but also neighboring Central Asian republics, from China, from the West. So that's going to be quite a difficult exercise. However, Kazakhs are aware that uh, Russia is a strong threat uh, over the long term. 
Eurasia Economic Union is good for Kazakhstan somehow because it provides you know a territory of about 14 percent of the world's land and almost 182 million population so you have access to this population because Kazakhstan is a small population country about 17.7 million people living there although land wise it's the fifth or sixth largest in the world Therefore, it has access to a huge market through the customs union uh, started as a f uh, free trade area, customs union, and then common market perhaps in the future. Uh, so Russians are using some economic instruments like this, defense, intelligence, and as well as the, uh, the Eurasia Economic Union uh, to be more effective and key player in Kazakhstan. Whereas China is using its soft power, providing a favorable term uh, credits and investing heavily in Kazakhstan's infrastructure. And this uh, famous uh, One Belt, One Road initiative started by Xi Jinping of uh, China is a godsend gift to Kazakhstan because this is a landlocked nation. It requires access to high value markets other than China, Russia and neighboring countries. So if this Silk Road, modern Silk Road could be resurrected and built and it will get Kazakhstan all the way to Europe thanks to this economic corridor to be created. So this is going to help significantly Kazakhstan's international uh, standing. But on the other hand, there is concern about the future intentions of China known as Khitai in that region, whether it has a hidden agenda like it has in South China Sea. We see the potential clashes there. And therefore, whoever comes to power in the aftermath of Nazarbayev has to treat very carefully between this conflicting interest. It's not only Eurasian Economic Union we have in the region, we also have collective security treaty organizations, sort of the NATO of the region led by uh, Russia. And then you have also Shanghai Cooperation Organization initiated to fight fundamentalism and terrorism, ethnic terrorism in the region. It was led by China in, uh, and uh, to a certain extent Russia. So this is an incredibly difficult task, balancing act as well for Kazakh leaders uh, to handle China on the one hand, Russia on the other hand, and also Western countries. My personal opinion is east of Baku, forget about the West. We also have some multinationals, of course, operating in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, but east of Baku, it's basically China and Russia firing the shots. And increasingly so, China will be dominating the sphere of influence more than Russia. So in the future, I mean, today's marriage of convenience between China and Russia might be coming to an end. We might see some also tension and conflicts between the two, because also don't forget that the Russians are worried about Chinese illegal immigrants coming to the Far East, which is sparsely populated, less Russians, huge resources. So there is even scenarios I remember from Tom Clancy's Baron Dragon, uh, the fiction Roman, fiction novel, in which China and Russia fight each other. China is trying to invade that part of the world. So, therefore, uh, I think the uh, integration projects of Russia and China, uh, if they have to make a choice, perhaps there is more offered from the Chinese side than Russia.